When you talk about the penultimate episode of anything, in a lot of instances, the penultimate edition usually ends up being better than the finale for a lot of people. So is that the case with the Wheel of Time? Let's talk about it. When change comes, you can scream and try to force things to stay the same, but you'll usually end up getting trampled. However, if you can direct changes, they can serve you. Nobody walks a difficult path without stumbling now and again. It didn't break you when you fell. That's the important part. Incomplete knowledge is better than complete ignorance. I wonder if we sometimes put the White Tower before the people that we serve. I wonder if we let it become a goal instead of a means to help us achieve greater goals. And yet so many of us do it without families, without love, without passion beyond our own particular interests. So even while we try to guide the world, we separate ourselves from it. We risk arrogance. We always assume that we know best, but risk making ourselves unable to fathom the people we claim to serve. Prudence is for those who intend to live long lives. Hey, what's up wheelies and dark friends? Mike back one more time before the finale of The Wheel of Time. And that's because today we're going to be talking about book number 13, The Towers of Midnight. And I always say The Towers of Midnight. It's just, it's just Towers of Midnight. And you would think, okay, that's not a big deal. You have no idea how much I get corrected on some of these things that I say. It's not The Towers of Midnight. Anyhow, guys, uh, lots and lots of things going on with this book. And um, a lot of my past reviews recently have gotten a lot more mixed reception, I guess you'd say, where a lot of people that used to go from, I love your reviews, to uh, I don't think you're actually reading these because I've, uh, I've disagreed with some people. And I expected that to happen here kind of towards the end because, uh, yeah, there's going to be some mixed opinions about this book because I don't feel the same way about certain characters that people that are on their sixth reread of the series feel like. But again, that's just how things are. This is my first trip through the wheel of time and now i'm one book away from the end so i'm here to talk about these things guys if you don't know by now these reviews are going to be spoiler heavy i don't think you're going to be curious about non-spoilers for book number 13 of a fantasy series so if you don't know by now that these are spoilers that's on you but i feel like i got to get that out there everything or else someone's going to hit me with you should have told me that it has spoilers in it so yeah, there's spoilers in it. And let's just do what I've always done with these, and that is just kind of go by each character and talk about what happened with them in this book, what I liked, what I didn't like. You know, that's pretty much it. Uh, so let's start off with Lan, because I don't feel like he's got a huge part in this book. And something that I feel like Sanderson has doing is doing much more than Jordan did is he's not devoting an entire chapter to one POV character. He changes POV characters all the time. Like, I don't, I don't think there's very many chapters in this book that sticks with just one character. It usually flips around between two or three of them per chapter now. And that's, uh, that's actually made it uh, a little bit more fluid, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, it feels more like a uh, <laughs> like a Stormlight book, right? Uh, so let's talk about Lan up first. Uh, he is continuing his ride to Tarwin's Gap. Pretty much just every once in a while it comes in, he's just annoyed that, it, that Nynaeve tricked him. Uh, but uh, yeah, a few join him along the way and he just continues to kind of convince them not to. He's just being all grumpy. You know, just being land, right? And, uh, you know, a few dozen turns into a few thousands. I think the actual way that Sanderson puts it is, you know, two became five, five became a dozen, and a dozen became thousands. And, you know, to the point where it finally gets to, uh, when, by the time we get to Candor and we see the golden crane flying, land stops, finally stops the stubbornness. He embraces his uh, his, his kinghood and uh, just kind of goes with it. And it's a force, by the end of that, they, they kind of, uh, they arrive at Tarwin's Gap. And like I said, he's kind of embraced his title, Lord of the Seven Towers, Defender of the Wall, the First Fires, Bearer 
of the Sword of the Thousand Lakes, the King of Malkir. And I'm not going to lie, I thought it would be a much more powerful moment than it was. It's okay. It was okay. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're facing, a, what, Shadow Spawn, Trollic Horde of about 150,000 with their 12,000 as, a, you know, as a kind of the credits roll in this book. So um, while it wasn't bad or anything, I don't know. I guess I was just expecting something more epic in that moment when he finally, you know, uh, to, you know I always keep on referring to Lord of the Rings, you know, become who he was born to be kind of thing. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that was just on me. I, I don't know. I mean, again, I didn't have a problem with it. I just didn't get the, you know, the goose flesh. I think that the Nynaeve's uh, or, or the, the whole... The Golden Crane Flies for Tarman Gaiden moment was, was much more impactful than this moment was, I thought. And that's just kind of surprising. You told me that it would feel like that, that I would like Nynaeve's moment of that more than I would like Land's moment of that. You know, even five books ago, I probably would have been stunned that you told me that. Uh, but that's kind of where I am. Let's move along now to uh, Rand. You know what? I actually want to start my clock here because I don't want this to go... Uh, too long. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Wheel of Time review that's not going to be long. Give me a break. Uh, Rand has such a big part in The Gathering Storm. I didn't expect him to have too big of a part in this one. He's got some big moments, but uh, you know there is stuff that I, I'll feel like I can talk about him early in this review and don't feel like I'm kind of saving the best for last kind of thing. So he comes down from Dragon Mountain after he had, he's had his old, you know, I guess he's regained his humanity, so to speak. He's remembered how to smile, as Casman would put it. Uh, but he, he walks through this field and uh, where there's uh, all this rotting fruit, all these you know, rotten apples or whatever, and uh, he starts bringing them back. They start coming back to uh, fruition. Is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, they start you know, going back to, to ripe, ready to eat or whatever. And I started thinking, okay, so if the Dark One's touch can, you know, as he starts to make everything rot or taint or whatever, I've the, is only the creator can manipulate things like this, right? So I mean, this is more than just like Jesus Rand. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I thought it was like wow, that's that's impressive. So um, yeah, he tells the the, the farmer uh, to uh, you know go ahead and pick everything now, so uh, that it'll because he doesn't know how long it'll last or whatever. So interesting. But uh, he says he's got to head to Tarvalin uh, to have a discussion that he says quote she's not going to be happy about. And, think we know who that is um but uh when he gets to the tower he's joined by 13 ice die they're shielding him and i'm like man what balls you know dragon balls you know after after what happened to him in lord of chaos i never thought he'd put himself in that situation again but it's it just he walks in there like he owns the place and at this point i'm like i can see it you know and i and i Hair stand up a little bit on the, on the arms here because I'm just I've been waiting kind of for this this confrontation to see these two uh, uh, meet each other again in such different places than the last time they were. But you know the Amarlin she uh, she checks him for madness and Rand's like I ain't got time for that shit. I'm here to tell you I plan to break the Dark One seals. All right and uh, you know we need to work together and knock this shit off. And it, I'm, I'm all on board obviously, but of course you know how she is. Uh, she's like nope nope. Uh, but again, Rand's like, it's not a discussion. I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. It's happening. However, you can meet me in a month at the Field of Marilor. Is it Marilor? I believe it's Marilor. And uh, we can talk about it then. And then he bounces. He's out. And I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, it wasn't quite as you know antagonistic as I thought it could get, but it didn't exactly go well. And I'll talk about that a little more when I get to the whole Omerlin section. Um <laughs> Yes, I'm intentionally not saying her name. Uh, so uh, Rand pardons Cad Swain. That was something I brought up on my wish list. Was pe was Cad Swain going to still have a part in the story? You know, with potentially Moraine coming back and with Rand, you know, banishing her on pain of death. Uh, but he does he does a uh, uh, pardon her. He revokes her exile or whatever, and uh, he reconciles with Tam. And this is a beautiful moment. Obviously, uh, he apologizes to him. He hugs him. He cries, and Tam just always so calm, cool, and collected, like, it's okay, man. Everybody stumbles. We'll get past this. And I just, I love that relationship. I mean, I don't think we've had a ton of it in this series, but obviously it feels like a father-son relationship should, right? And uh, I'm all for it. And, and, and he does uh, uh, reintroduce men, or actually first, first time introduces men to his dad. And he's like, you know, we already met, but, you know, the fact that he wants to introduce her just lets him know that that's someone that's very, very important to him. And as me, a Rand plus men guy, 
I was all for it. So uh, beautiful, beautiful little kind of ending arc of what happened in Gathering Storm to now. Uh, uh, there is another little bit. I've told you guys about my growing affection for Nynaeve in every one of these books. And of course, uh, it's even more in this one for other reasons. But the beginning of it is Nynaeve comes up to Rand after he returns, tells him she's going to go back to Tarvalon, but you know he thanks her for holding things together while he was going through a shit, you know, and that was important. And I, I, I it's just, I love the relationship that they have at this point. It, it's, it's, it's so good. Anytime I see any of the two rivers folk getting along uh, and, and showing that they actually, you know, genuinely care for each other, gets you in the feels just a little bit, I think. But um, uh, he tells her not to give up. Her passion, you know, because that's what makes her what she is. It's just, it's a great moment, great dialogue, beautifully written. And uh, it's uh, kind of a, a parting of the ways for those two until they inevitably see each other at Tarmagate and that I'm, I'm, I'm for. I love it. I, I, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, but uh, there's more moments where brands like restoring uh, ruined food and crops normal, things like that. I don't want to get too deep into it. Uh, but he does meet uh, Rodello Toralda on the, on the uh, battlefield. Uh, he does, he's in a bad situation. Uh, he's kind of been, I, I said I felt like he was the one guy who's been able to uh, overcome some impossible odds against the Shan Chan and stuff like that. Now he's fighting uh, Trollocs or whatnot. But he's uh, he's, in, he's a moment from death, really, before uh, Rand shows up and apologizes for not being able to make peace with the Shan Chan. And so he goes down there to fight Trollocs and he just nukes the shit out of thousands of these guys. I mean, huge huge moment i mean this is he had something like that when he was with Logan. i believe it was in knife of dreams but here it's like to me it just feels like it's even more he's using all these numerous weaves that i didn't even write down it's just he is full on at the peak of his powers here and he just levels this place before either either they're dead or they're like let's get the hell out of here and they run back into the blight so crazy crazy op moment but yeah i'm here for it i'm here for just badass Rand at this point. He's just, uh, it, it's like Neo in Major Crew Loaded where <laughs> the people will fire the bullets and he just like puts the hand up and the bullets just like stop. That's where Rand's at right now. Just like he is in control. You know, he paid the cost to be the boss now, right? Uh, so later on in tier, Rand does actually uh, touch Kalendor and Min has a viewing and it's something about seeing, seeing the... Kalidor being held by a hand made of onyx or something? I don't know. I've never I've never understood her viewings. I know it's something that you'll appreciate more in a reread. But look, guys, it's taken me a year plus to read this. A lot of stuff I see behind you, I've never read. I don't see myself doing a reread of this anytime soon. I never say never, but uh, don't be expecting a reread on this channel anytime soon or whatever. So I'm just saying I feel like men's viewings are something you'll probably catch a lot more in a reread but for right now i'm just like i don't know what that means to me that's like trying to answer riddles i've never been good at riddles so uh there it is there it is I, but i'm sure i'll say that it will be playing into something in memory of light uh i've seen the i've seen the cover i you know i don't even know if that's supposed to be calendar on the cover i don't know anyway uh big moment i think that's finally kind of something that i've complained about for a while that's the way that cad swain talks to rand and how i always am like look I understand she's supposed to be a mentor and things like that and kind of like, you know, teach him how to behave or whatnot. But I was like, you can do that shit respectfully. I feel like you can do, you can teach someone and mold someone into something without being a complete asshole to them and treating them like a child. And so at one point she does, she calls him boy and he just snaps back, I'm 400 years old. And I, I, I demand your respect more than that. <laughs> and I love it. I recall correctly. I believe she, she says like she's proud of him or whatever. So yeah, yeah. Just again, another great moment for Rand. I feel like this is tying up all the problems or all the shortcomings that I found. And now we can just finally focus on Tarman Gaten here in the last book. And that's exactly what I wanted. So Rand's story in this is doing everything in Gathering Storm and in this that I wanted. I feel like Rand is at a place now where... I'm ready for the last battle of Rand. I don't need anything else. Anything else I get, cool. It'll be a bonus. Besides that reunion with the three Taviran, I, there's nothing else really I need from Rand in this. Uh, but uh, that's pretty much it. He's in the epilogue. Uh, he's having a dream of Lan Lanfear saying that she, uh, she wants to be free uh, before she says he is coming. And that's kind of it. Uh, Lanfear, I, I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw a shot put, which isn't far. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at with her. 
Let's keep it moving along here now with Avienda. Now, I've been very vocal in the last few reviews that uh, Avienda stuff hasn't really been grabbing me. Uh, even in the last book, I think it was just kind of like, yeah, cool, she figured out their little trick about how to become a wise one. It just wasn't really much. I wasn't really feeling it or whatever. I mean, it's been... I can't even count how many books it's been since I've really been invested in this character. Before, it was just like she was just there to, to keep telling Elaine to quit being stupid. And then it was like nothing. So it was, I feel like this is the first one we finally get something. And it started slow to where I was like, I've already seen this movie, Sanderson. I don't need you to play me the greatest hits from uh, The Shadow Rising. But it has enough of a little twist in it here that I actually really liked it. So, you know, she's back in Ruidian and uh, she tries to feel uh, the purpose of the glass columns, you know, like uh, like she's done with the Terra Angriol a few times. And things just kind of go crazy. Now, like I said, I thought we were just going to get another moment like where Ram was seeing all of his ancestry in the Shadow Rising. But what this is, is she sees her descendants instead of her ancestors. So she's seeing the future. So this is like, oh, okay, this is interesting. But she sees that the Aeol are eventually, this is what she sees like after the last battle. And she's seeing that uh, her, uh, that the Aeol just are going to be wiped out eventually by the Sanchan. And she wants to know, basically, you know, is this something that is fluid? Is this something that's going to come to pass no matter what we do? Or is this, uh, you know, is this like the dead zone with Stephen King where you, you, you can see it and you can change it? And so it's very interesting. I'm not really sure what she could do really to change it necessarily. But uh, it was interesting enough that I'm like, wow, okay, that's that's a little twist from Ruidian that I didn't expect there. So uh, props to that. Uh, but very, very interesting in, uh, in getting... Uh, not just like a, a redux of that, but enough of a twist that it was something that I appreciated reading again. And I feel like that's something uh, like if you go back to that Shadow Rising review, I was saying like when I first read that chapter, I was kind of annoyed. And then I reread it and I was like blown away by how incredible it was. So uh, I, I didn't reread this one, but at least it helped me understand what was going on to a point where I think I got it before Avienda understood what was going on. But uh, very cool. Very cool. And I hope I don't know if that's really something that's going to be answered in a memory light because I don't think that in memory of light you're going to have your big climax and then you're going to learn about what happens 15 years after the last battle I mean I don't think so I think it'd be kind of anticlimactic so I don't know I don't know if this is something that's going to be answered or not hmm we'll see we'll see let's move on to Nynaeve uh, I talked about my growing affection for her and it just grows even more in this book to where She's one of my favorites in the whole series at this point, and I never thought even five books ago that that was going to happen. So uh, incredible, incredible art for Nynaeve. For all you people who say you just don't like strong women, you aren't listening. Uh, I love Nynaeve. I love men. Uh, I, I love many things about many of the female characters in here, just not the one that you guys like, apparently. Uh, but she's checking out a bubble of evil, and she decides to delve with an Ashaman. I can't recall his name. I'm sorry. There's so many of them. And she inspects his madness. And she describes it as like these black thorns or whatever. And she's able to re remove them and she cures his madness. Like, whoa, this is a game changer. This is even bigger than when she cured Stilling and Gentling. Uh, I don't remember what book ago that was. That was a long time ago. But it was like, wow, okay. Okay, this video is going to be a mess because it's the third time I've gotten interrupted. And then there was like a long crew for an hour. So I don't even remember where I was. It was talking about Nynaeve. I think that she was uh, curing... Uh, madness. So uh, yeah, she continues to just be awesome. I mean, uh, I, I, the whole thing about, well, why do you like it when Nynaeve does it, but you don't like it when the Amarlin does it? And I'll get into it when I talk about her in a minute. And yes, I'm going to keep calling her the Amarlin. You guys brought me to this. It's like a bad word in my house now. Uh, but uh, she tries to do the same thing on Rand, uh, try to cure his madness or take a peek. And she looks near it, but uh, where that Ashman only had like a... a you know, one set of the black thorns she sees just like numerous and they're like covered in this white light and just she can't do anything. So uh, obviously uh, I'm just believing that this is just the, uh, like you had the whole thing about the wound and the thing fighting. It's a kind of the same thing going on in his head right now. You got the darkness and the light kind of fighting or whatever. That's how I took it as. I don't know. I don't know. Probably someone will probably explain that a little more to me. If it's something that's going to be uh, referenced in a memory of light, Hmm, memory of light. Hmm. Uh, don't tell me, obviously. But uh, that's kind of where I took it as. But uh, we are going back to the tower and the Aes Sedai. Wait. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, the Aes Sedai testing for, for Nynaeve. That's where she's headed. And it's uh, the testing is a little more difficult than usual. And I'm just going to say it's because Egwene is a tit. Oh, I said it. I said it. 
Uh, it's because, uh, yeah, she knows 90 personally, and so she makes the test a little harder. And my theory on this is because she can't dare stand that someone else might be better than her. And that's what I really think that this is. And sure, is my growing animosity towards her contributing to that? Maybe. Maybe, but it just feels like that. She knows Nynaeve's better, but you know what? You know someone's better, you're always going to kind of stack the deck against them. It's just kind of human nature or whatnot. So I can't really blame her there, but it still d d doesn't help for, you know, my my growing disdain for that character right there. And also, Nynaeve's my, my girl now, so I, I feel like i got to protect her. Not that she needs any help from me, right? But uh, they raised her to Aes Sedai even though she failed for using a forbidden weed, which we know is Balefire or whatever. And uh, the biggest moment here for me is that Nynaeve says she would choose Lan over being an Aes Sedai any time. And I feel like that's a kind of a full arc for her from back, I think it's all the way back in Dragon Reborn when she took her test to become accepted and you know she had to basically walk away from Lan and her future children to, to, to pass that test. And to hear she's like, I would choose Lan every single time over this. I would choose helping others over being identifying as an Aes Sedai. And another awesome moment, like I said, I don't know if this was always a direction that things were going with Nynaeve, but it's just like, gosh, ever since Knife of Dreams, I have just loved every moment with this character, and I just can't get enough. I want more. I want more Nynaeve here. I love it. I love everything that she's doing here. Uh, they swear to make her never use Balefire again, and she's like, I might need to use that to help Rand in the last battle. You know that thing you guys don't really seem to be paying much attention to right now? So, again, high five Nynaeve. She's awesome. Uh, and to finish it off here, she goes and she visits She visits uh, Morel, Myrell, who has a uh, Lan's bond or whatever. And she tries to go in there and talk to him. Morel's like, ah, oh, come back tomorrow. I'll talk to you then. And Nynaeve's like, Yo, you don't understand. This is what's going to happen. And it's going to happen now. And I run shit. And God, this woman is so awesome. I love her. I, I just can't say enough right now about how I feel like this character's taken a 180 for me, where I never really had any disdain for Nynaeve. I was just like, gosh, she's such a hothead. And she's just always mad and quit yanking your goddamn braid. Love it. I love it. I, I really think that I might end this series with Nynaeve being my favorite character. And I never thought that that would happen. So, people think that I've gotten really negative in these reviews. Does this sound like negativity? I love the growth of this character so much. And it's amazing. What an arc it has been. And just wonderful, wonderful writing. And I love it. Just fantabulous. Uh, she's in the big fight in the tower later, which I'll get into uh, now. And I'll start with talking about Gawain. I know how everybody talks about Gawain. Uh, let me talk about what happens in this book, and then I'll address that. Um, <clears throat> Blood Knives. Uh, Sean Chan assassins. I think those are really awesome, really kick ass. I'm just imagining like these freaking ninjas and stuff. Uh, but they're sent to the tower to take out the Armalin. And uh, what is really awesome about that, like, she keeps getting pissed because he keeps like saving her and she doesn't want to be protected, all that kind of stuff. But when the shit goes down big time, Gawain fights off three of them, but uh, you know, he's he's fatally wounded. But dude, I don't think that people understand here. That this might be the best swordsman in this entire series. I mean, he he fights off three of these things, and he he fights two of them in the dark and wins. He's a badass man. I think only Land might be maybe maybe the only better sword fighter than him. I don't know. I don't know. That's at least that's how I'm reading it. I am definitely reading that Gawain is a badass with a sword, but uh, Egwene does heal him and bonds him as her warder, like in my opinion, has been inevitable since, like, book four or five. I don't know. Uh, but uh, he discovers his mother is still alive. And, but he's still reluctant to give up his Rand hate. And I think maybe that's why people don't like him. I don't, I don't even know. I don't even care. I think these are two annoying characters and they belong together. But really, I can't even say annoying because Gawain doesn't really bother me. He's just kind of useless except for sword fighting. Uh, I, I noticed that when Sanderson took over... Uh, he, he definitely gave him an expanded role. I don't know if that was always in the plans or if this was someone that Sanderson just liked more. Uh, I say that he's mostly useless ex unless shit's going down and you need, a, you need a sword. So yeah, he should have just been kind of a quiet swordsman or whatever, I think. That's why they changed. But, but people comparing him with like Elaine, I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, but uh, let's get on to that other half of that annoying couple. You know her. Um... 
the reason that I feel like I need to talk about this because guys, I said it in the, in the, in the gathering storm comments that I stopped replying to comments because I felt like they would just gotten nasty. And one thing about this fandom I've always loved is that people were like, you know, that's, that's if you disagree, that's fine. I, I respect that. And it just seems like the second that I said, I didn't really care for this arc with the Gawain, everyone just kind of jumped all over me and it just completely shocked me. Uh, because you know, like I said, I went from people being like, I love your reviews to, I don't believe you actually read this. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just weird to me. And I, I feel like I've, I've criticized this character in the past and never really got any pushback. But whenever I did it after knife of dreams, it was just like, I was talking about people's mama or something. It just completely caught me off guard. But, um, what I've said on this channel the whole time is that, uh, we're allowed to disagree and still be pals the next day. I'm perfectly fine with disagreeing. And I'm never going to bullshit you. I'm always going to be honest with you. And uh, I'd say, Gwen, it still continues that arc going down for me. She really, really does. Um, it starts off, like, right away with this meeting between her and Rand where she decides Rand needs to be stopped. And she starts writing letters to other rulers asking for aid. I understand there where she's coming from. I understand but I still feel like you're playing politics when the last battle's right here. I don't, I don't know. Again, that one I can kind of let slide because I get where she's coming from. But I feel like us as the reader, we're on Rand's side. And now you've got someone who's opposing him, basically. Trying to stop. You're, you're, you're just being that annoying gnat while I'm trying to focus on the greater problem. You're the one crying about an election during uh when there's a virus going on in the states right now you know that's that's how i feel about like this that's how i feel like what's going on with her character so the black aja attack the tower masana is revealed to be danielle i don't even know if i had a theory on that i you guys know my opinion on the forsaken at this point i, I couldn't even remember how many of them were left uh but uh she does get the upper hand on her and actually slaps an, uh, a dom collar on her and i was like oh Okay, this is taking me back to the Great Hunt here. Uh, you know, when 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 Egwene actually got the the collar on her, and I believe it was a Great Hunt. I'm thinking, oh great, there's going to be some like some PTSD here, or something for her to deal deal with, right? No, not anymore, not this Egwene. Look, I regret using the word Mary Sue. I think that's what really set a lot of people off. Where I exact words were, I feel like she's leaning towards becoming a Mary Sue because she always fails upward. I mean, she always wins. And if she if she fails, she fails upward somehow. And I, I stick by that. But I probably shouldn't have used that word because, you know, feelings and people get all upset about these things. So why don't I go with OP? She's super OP because she just believes this collar off her neck and off it comes. And then she, she just crushes Masana's little mind like a grape in a battle of wills because she's just so strong. I don't even think Nynaeve could do this. Remember Nynaeve fought Megidian and it was nothing like this. So I'm sorry, guys. I just don't buy the forced bullshit with Egwene as a character. I don't buy it. And I'm not going to back off of it. I hate that you guys feel like you can't listen to my reviews anymore because we disagree on this topic or that I don't understand. I understand. I just don't buy it. It's wish fulfillment garbage and I don't like it. There it is. So she opposes Rand and also tries to tie Perrin up during the middle of a battle. There's a battle, there's Forsaken, there's Black Aja everywhere, there's fire, there's, there's all kinds of shit going down. And she tries to tie Perrin up and be like, I'll deal with you later? How can you guys not understand the problems I have with this character? How do you not see this? She's power tripping hard, man. Big time. And, and I say she's one step below Darth Rand at this point. I don't get why people can't understand why I don't like her. So the last battle's coming. She's only concerned with politics. Like I said, it, it feels like what we've got going on right now in the States is you've got all this political posturing when you've got a quarantine that we're fully living in. I don't, I don't care about your politics right now. I care about the task at hand, which is Tarman Gaiden. And I don't feel like they're worried about the right things right now. So... <sighs> That's where I'm at. Let's talk about, you know what? That might be where I need to break it. Uh, yeah, because uh, Perrin and Matt are the majority of this book. And so I want to give them the, uh, the, the the attention that they deserve. So uh, let's take a break here and uh, we'll go back into uh, part two of this review right after this. Hang tight.